and we realized that the the common th thread was that we were dealing with vulnerable populations you know uh, throughout whether it's persons you who use drugs or Roma or people with disabilities or you know, other minority groups uh, these people were vulnerable in healthcare settings and often healthcare settings were a place of abuse for these people if they eventually they would encounter a hospital or you know clinic whatever and quite often treated very poorly in those settings and so that was the common thread that was the the way to to bring it together and we had a palliative care initiative you know where we dealt with people who were dying or who suffered extreme pain because of cancer and so on and that was also in you know, the same you know a, a human rights um, argument could be made even though it was very, it was run by a doctor and it was more medically oriented in some respects and they did a lot of training of doctors but they saw it immediately yes it's it's a question of human rights not to be in severe pain i mean imagine that right and that when there is something that exists like oral morphine it is a human rights violation not to offer it to people who are in severe pain. So once you started to put the human rights lens on almost anything we were doing, it just, you know, it worked, right? It sparked all kinds of ideas and different arguments. And that meant we could also go different places, you know, with medical arguments, you can talk to doctors, but if you have human rights arguments, you can talk to judges, to lawyers, you can talk to legislators, you know, you can, talk to journalists in a different way. It resonates in different ways. And, and of course, I was a human rights lawyer, so I knew what the right to health entailed and how we could argue that. So, I mean, I learned a lot of things. When I got there, obviously, I didn't present myself as the expert on palliative care or harm reduction or mental disability or sex worker you know because we had an initiative that dealt with sex work and sexual rights i remember in 2007 i think yeah the year i after i joined there was a huge conference of sex workers in south africa that we had helped put together with other donors and it brought together sex workers from all over the world, uh, including different countries of Africa, but from Europe and, and the United States and Asia. I mean, it was a huge thing. And I remember this is, it was like three days of listening to sex workers talk about their lives, what they have to deal with, access to healthcare, um, police brutality, which was a huge problem for them, criminalization, what it did to them, you know, their ability to travel, you know, when you're a sex worker and you've been criminalized, you know, there's lots of issues. So it was absolutely fascinating. I learned so much. Those three days I remember just being there. Wow. You know, so, you know, we had a Roma Health Initiative that was looking at access to health care for Roma, which, of course, was a huge issue because of the abusive treatment that Roma experience in healthcare settings in Eastern Europe. But they experienced abusive treatment everywhere, right? Not just in healthcare settings, but our beat was healthcare. And we thought maybe we can do something about that. And one of the, in conversations with people from Eastern Europe, uh, from the foundations, they told us one of the issues is that there are no health personnel that are Roma. So there's a big gap in cultural understanding. So we thought, you know, what if we funded young Roma students to go to medical school and nursing school and pharmacy school. And we can pick two countries where there's large Roma populations, where we have in the national foundations partners that are willing to do that. And we went to see George Soros and we presented this and we said we need $20 million over six years to do three cohorts in Romania and in Bulgaria of doctors, nurses, and pharmacists. And, and so he asked a few questions and he says, so you think you can pull this off? Do you have relationships with the ministry? And we explained how we'd 
used a model from South Africa that he had funded in 1984, which was medica medical education for, for South African blacks. And we were given so much freedom that we could do fantastic things. And it wasn't sort of northern driven agenda, really, because it was done in true partnership with uh, the staff from the foundations who were all local and their boards of directors were local and they had their own budgets, right? So we co-funded these things so that it wasn't us dictating with the money. It was really a joint agreement. Um, and I think that was another thing that the public health program understood. We were quite involved in HIV work, you know, with the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria, and going to the AIDS conferences every two years. And, and of course, there'd been a huge movement out of the AIDS community in the 90s for access to affordable medicines, life-saving medicines, right? The antiretroviral treatment and so on. And that movement had created, um, you know, what are known as TRIPS flexibilities, you know, arguing that the, the World Trade Organization has to allow in its treaties for the possibility for countries to procure drugs at a price that they can afford and for countries to issue a compulsory license uh, when they needed a drug for their public health system and just produce or have the drug produced in a the, in the nearby country so that they could save lives, right? So that whole idea of access to medicines really came out, I think, in that form from the HIV movement. We were familiar with it and we thought there was something there that we could develop into a body of work that would apply to other essential medicines. So we started, you know, exploring some of these ideas about patents and whether patents could be, should be granted for as long as they were and, and what were the practices of the pharmaceutical industry in keeping patents um, alive longer than they should be by, you know, evergreening and, you know, all these techniques and so on. So there was something wrong and inequitable about the fact that the public paid for these, the development of these drugs, at least in the earlier stages and then pharmaceutical companies would acquire these molecules and then bring them to market but then make a lot of money and not feel any kind of responsibility to the public so there was a an issue there that was a human rights issue for, of course because it's health and life but we also felt it was a justice issue fast forward in the last few years during the covid pandemic when you saw the groups that were arguing for vaccine equity and access to vaccines at fair prices and um, ways of dealing with vaccines that don't rely on intellectual strict intellectual property rights that this is a public good and in in a pandemic it should be treated as such so i think for for us access to medicines was really starting to think more i mean we always thought about justice but Think more explicitly about, you know, this is an area where it's life and health, but this is about really looking at the economic relationships uh, and the market dynamics and the way in which systems of intellectual property, which are not really a human rights question per se, are deployed to create inequitable and unjust results. So that's how we saw you know, the justice piece fitting into this. You know, it. we needed a justice lens to actually figure out what we wanted to do with access to medicines. We had a lot of money in some respects, but in fact, not that much, you know. I guess that's why they were afraid of us with access to medicines. Because <laughs> the ideas are too potent, you know. Justice and human rights is too potent. It's very hard to resist. So if, if we receive the support we deserve, we, we can do a lot. And so it was a real privilege to be able to do that while we could, you know, and, and I'm hopeful that other donors maybe will listen to this or will be inspired by some of these victories and some of the, the lasting legacies and, and pick up the slack and do it, you know, and fund it. That, that's my hope.